Hello, I'm Dr. Ruben Mesa, and on behalf of CME Outfitters, I would like to welcome you to today's educational activity entitled Expert Guidance on Novel Approaches in the Management of Myelofibrosis. Today's program is supported by an educational grant from GSK. Uh, again, this is myself, uh, and I'm in transition. I I'm, uh, was at the Mays Cancer Center and now am the Executive Director of the Atrium Health Wake Forest Baptist Comprehensive Cancer Center. Uh, I'd like to join my colleagues who uh, invite them to are joining me this evening to introduce themselves, starting with Dr. Angela Fleischman. Hi, uh, my name is Angela Fleischman. I'm a physician scientist and associate professor in the Division of Hematology and Oncology at the University of California, Irvine. Looking forward to tonight. Wonderful, thank you for joining us, Angela. A and Dr. Aaron Gertz. Hi, uh, thanks so much. It's wonderful to be with all of you this evening. My name is Aaron Gertz. I'm an Associate Professor of Medicine at the Cleveland Clinic, Cause Cancer Institute, and also serve as the Medical Director for the Case Comprehensive Cancer Center. Wonderful. So it's great having both of you on today and really look forward to our discussion. Let's start with our learning objectives. After participating in this activity, learners should be able to, one, identify the molecular and clinical features of myelofibrosis, that inform care plans, to evaluate novel and investigational therapies for the management of MF, three, devise personalized strategies to integrate evidence for myelofibrosis. Now to ask a question, please click on the ask question tab and type your question. Please include the faculty member's name if the question is specifically for them. Really, we, we hope for this to be an interactive and helpful session, so please feel free to ask questions, that, that's why we're here. So let's go ahead and jump in and Dr. Fleischman is going to kick us off today. Okay, thank you very much. So I am going to go over um, the biological basis of myeloproliferative neoplasms, just to set the stage so we're all on the same page um, before we go into more in-depth clinical information about, um, about the diseases. So with normal hematopoiesis, the central component to normal hematopoiesis lies in the hematopoietic stem cells, which can self-renew over one's entire lifespan and is the basis of why bone marrow transplants work, that one can have transplant stem cells from one person to the other, and it can constitute the entire immune system. Now, a normal immune system should have the ability to uh, keep homeostasis, to keep the appropriate numbers of different types of, of immune cells. In a myeloproliferative neoplasm, we know that the mutations arise at the level of the hematopoietic stem cells. Um, and this gives rise to, or, or results in unrestrained um, production of mature myeloid cells that really are not receiving the appropriate signals for when to grow and when to stop growing. And we when we talk about myeloproliferative neoplasms, um, in general, um, you know, when, when we're talking today about myeloproliferative neoplasms, we're talking about the first four um, columns here, um, which are BCR like able net, or the first five columns here, which are BCR able negative myeloproliferative neoplasms. Um, earlier stages include polycythemia vera, where the patients. Um, have an increased red blood cell mass, but can also have elevated white blood cells as well as platelets in essential thrombocythemia, um, in which the primary clinical issue is high platelets um, without, not without uh, a high red cell mass and in, um, infrequently elevated platelets. Prefibrotic myelofibrosis is a transition phase um, in which um, the person's bone marrow biopsy has some features of myelofibrosis, um, such as uh, dysplastic megakaryocytes, but may not necessarily have overt fibrosis on um, reticulin staining. And then with overt myelofibrosis, patient have, has overt myelofibrosis in the bone marrow. Um, myelofibrosis patients can have variable counts um, many times uh, patients will have um, low blood counts as opposed to an ET and PV where they have high, high uh, blood counts. 
And at the most extreme phase of a myeloproliferative neoplasm is a blast phase, um, which unfortunately, when arises in the setting of a chronic myeloproliferative neoplasm, has quite a, a dismal prognosis. So we do our best in these diseases um, to intervene um, with a, a, a transplant um, in patients who are, who are eligible, um, who we see um, the writing on the wall that uh, they're, um, they're progressing to that last phase. Wonderful. Now, as part of this educational initiative, we have something unique. We wanted you, the participants, to hear from actual patients with myelofibrosis on various topics related to the, their disease. In this first audio clip, we'll hear from patients about what it's like to live with myelofibrosis. My only real impact physically is anemia, low hemoglobin, and low red blood cell and white blood cell counts which does limit me to a certain extent for some physical activities. The other uh, physical impact is some uh, limited blood flow to my peripheral, you know, as in feet and hands and fingers. And I do, I am a little bit susceptible to cold. It's just exhausting. Emotionally is draining. I got to the point where I was reading too much into it and it was overwhelming me. And I just had a discussion with my physician and, and she just basically told me that let's live day to day, let's think about the future, but don't dwell on the future. I know that this disease will progress and it will get worse, but I'm just looking day to day and enjoying my life as I can. Wonderful. Now, how do these comments uh, resonate with you, Angela? Does it sound similar to the patients that you see? Yes, it does sound similar to the patients I see. Um, I re I'm really struck, um, honestly, of how um, unique each NPN patient is, um, that two people could have potentially similar, very similarly appearing diseases, but yet the, the, the way that they're feeling and the, the, the way that they are um, dealing with their disease is, is very different. Um, so that's why I honestly really enjoy being an NPN physician is that I really enjoy getting to know my patients and to, to try to identify what the best way to treat the person in front of me is because it may not be the right way to treat another person with seemingly the same, same disease. Um, so I, I, I think MPN patients, it, it, it's, they have a huge symptom burden as well as a huge anxiety burden because of their, their, their diagnosis many times. Um, and so it's, a, it's a, a unique group of patients. No, very true. It, it, and Aaron, what about yourself? Yeah, I think uh, a lot of those statements definitely resonate with me and considering the patients I see in clinic, um, you know, the, the tiredness, the feelings of anemia, the fatigue are, are things that I hear about, you know, every time I'm in clinic, it, it's a pretty universal symptom. Um, and, and, and like Angela mentioned, you know, when you can make inroads on those symptoms, it, it's incredibly rewarding to take care of these patients. You know, some patients, um, you know, I had a patient who really loved playing the saxophone and because of his anemia, he couldn't play the saxophone anymore. And, and ever, ever since we got him on the right track and fixed his anemia, he's been out uh, actually gigging uh, with his jazz band, which is, you know, it's incredible to make an impact on someone's life like that. Well, it, it's really fantastic. You know, I think, you know, I have been involved with many years with these patients. You're right. The, you know, individualized medicine is, you know, both precision medicine around molecular mutations and things of that nature, but also really understanding the burdens patients face, you know, and how really we can alleviate them. So that, that truly, as you said, Angela, is a very rewarding part of working with these folks. So why don't we proceed, Angela? Why don't you take us through the mutations and NPNs? Okay, great. So now back to now, now back to mutations and NPN. Um, among all pH negative NPNs, JAK2 is the most common, almost, you know, seeming almost nearing 100 percent of patients have a mutation in JAK2. Most of them have a JAK2 B617F mutation. Um, a smaller fraction, a few percent, will have 
uh, mutations in another location in JAK2. Um, how reticulin mutations are not seen in PV, um, but can be seen in um, most of the patients with JAK2 negative ET and um, myelofibrosis. Um, nipple is also seen in ET and, um, and myelofibrosis. Included here in these bullet points is BCR ABLE. However, BCR ABLE is seen in CML and not necessarily in pH negative um, um, MPN. But it isn't important to, to note that you know, CML is also a myeloproliferative neoplasm. And um, many times patients will get, um, you know, obviously many of them will have be tested for JAK2 mutations. Um, there are two options for testing, a qualitative, meaning yes, no, and a quantitative where we get an allele burden, um, which um, can quantify the percentage of mu mutated JAK2 genes in a sample. Doesn't quite necessarily mean the percentage of cells um, that have the JAK2 mutation because each, uh, each gene has two copies in a cell. Um, but um, there's two options for testing for JAK2. The clinical relevance of the JAK2 allele burden um, is a little unclear. Um, so unclear of the, the true clinical um, sort of utility of checking a JAK2 allele burden. Um, Im important to note, um, and I think that these next slides, um, my my primary point is to demonstrate that all of the JAK, all of the mutations seen in MPN really have a very co a common end end result, meaning they all activate JAK-STAT signaling pathways in one way or the other. So the JAK-STAT signaling pathways are important for many um, cytokine growth factors um, that we utilize, our, our um, system utilizes to produce, um, to produce um, cells. And in general, in a, in a wild type or normal JAK2 cell, um, the growth factor, such as erythropoietin, is necessary in order to activate JAK2 to turn on gene expression program that would tell um, um, erythroid progenitor to produce more red blood cells. However, with the JAK2 v 67 to death mutation, the JAK2 is in the, always on an on form. So basically, the cells are thinking they're always getting erythropoietin or similar growth factors that utilize JAK2. Um, now, with the other mutations, such as cal reticulin or MIPL, you could say, well, what do these have to do with the JAKSTAT signaling pathway? Well, in, interestingly, they both activate JAKSTAT signaling in their own way. The cal reticulin uh, protein, the cal reticulin mutations make a new function of the cal reticulin protein so that it actually binds to the MIPL, which is thrombopoietin receptor, and leads to uh, constitutive activation. Um, and MIPL, MIPL is the thrombopoietin receptor, so the mutations lead to um, a change in, in formation such that the, the signaling pathway is always on. So I think the primary point here is that even though somebody doesn't have a JAK2 mutation, um, they still have activation of JAK-STAT signaling. Um, so, could, so JAK inhibition could be beneficial for them. And then in addition to the, what we call their driver mutations, which is JAK2, paraticulin, or MIPL, um, in which most patients have a single driver mutation, there are rare people who have two different mutations, but that's a, a pretty much an exceedingly rare um, situation. MPN patients can have additional mutations in other genes that are um, mutated in other heme malignancies as well. Um, and some of these mutations, such as ASXL1, EZH2, or IDH mutations, um, can portend a um, poorer prognosis. Um, and in particular, in um, younger patients who would be um, candidates for transplant, um, may be of, of utility to know, um, know what other mutations your patient has just to help with prognostication. Wonderful. Well, in this next set of audio clips, we'll hear from patients about the challenges they encounter when coping with myelofibrosis. I do have some challenges with the fatigue and because of the low blood counts and the anemia. So it does limit me 
physically to a certain extent. I have not spoken with anybody, but there is a support group page on Facebook of patients that have this and the biggest challenges that they face is fatigue. So it's true without question. I think this last comment is a very relevant one. You know, fatigue is multifactorial, but I think there's multiple aspects of it from MF that really contribute the, the anemia factor, aspects of inflammation, uh, anxiety and distress, all, all kind of culminate in that very uh, prevalent one. Uh, Angela, do these uh, uh, resonate with you? Yes, definitely. I, I mean, it's, it, it's amazing how, um, how impactful, at least in, in some patients, the, the fatigue associated with their, with their MPN is. I mean, in many cases, it can be quite debilitating um, and, and is, um, you know, a, a, difficult, a, a difficult thing to, to address. Um, it's really wonderful, in particular, um, you know, probably in the situation that um, Aaron was talking about before, where you have somebody who's really debilitated and fatigued. And then you do something for them that's really life changing. It's it's just wonderful to, to to see that transformation. And this is a disease where we can sometimes see transformations like that. And Aaron, what sort of approaches, in addition to medicines, have you seen patients take? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, definitely, this is uh, patients will take all kinds of different action. Um, you know, certainly you know, anemic patients, we try to do things to alleviate their anemia, but, you know, the fact that so many patients, even with ET and PV, have this debilitating fatigue, as you mentioned, it's really multifactorial. So I think a lot of the, what I end up doing is sitting down with the patient and trying to unpackage all the things that might be contributing to their fatigue and try to work on the entire picture of fatigue. So, you know, when someone maybe doesn't have very good sleep hygiene, we work on, we try to talk about ways that we might improve their, their sleep hygiene and you know, maybe uh, some patients have really found exercise to be beneficial um, and often tout the, uh, the pilot study that, that was done using yoga to alleviate symptoms in myelofibrosis and, and other MPNs. Um, you know, some patients do try various uh, diet and exercise changes uh, and find some success there as well. Uh, but um, really, you know, I think the key there, though, as you mentioned, since it, it is multifactorial, sitting down with that individual patient and working through all the different contributors that may be adding up to their uh, uh, fatigue to try to make it better on the whole. Wonderful. Well, Angela, why don't you take us to kind of a bit of the summary from your section on the clinical complications in MS? Okay. So staying on the fatigue and the, and, and the symptoms, which from this slide really are, are, are at the center. Um, it's, unclear exactly what drives the symptoms in MPN. However, um, we do know that it's a very inflammatory disease and multiple inflammatory cytokines are elevated in, in a myeloclopid neoplasm. Certain inflammatory cytokines have been correlated with certain specific um, symptoms. So it's clear that at least some of the symptom burden is driven directly by inflammatory cytokines. Um, other clinical complications in, in particular in myelofibrosis, anemia, which unfortunately um, is, is a difficult one to treat in patients with myelofibrosis, as well as thrombosis. Um, thrombosis is not only a feature of myelofibrosis, but is a significant issue in both um, polycythemia vera as well as essential thrombocythemia. Wonderful. Well, that's really been a great kind of anchor for our discussion today, Angela, and thank you for taking us through that. Next, let's pivot to yourself, Erin, and take us through the contemporary management of myelofibrosis. Yeah, thank you so much, and thank you, Angela, for uh, making my job a lot easier here. Um, so when putting together guidelines, it's often difficult. We talk about how each patient is their own patient, and you kind of take things on a case-by-case -case basis, but when doing guidelines, you really got to think about things that are easy to divide up into categories in order to build things like these algorithms. And so uh, we often rely on prognostic models um, to understand who may have a lower risk disease versus who may have a higher risk disease. And then we can build our kind of thought around treatment approaches on this construct. 
And if we look at patients with lower risk disease as predicted by these various models, um, we then think about who is symptomatic and who's asymptomatic. So someone who has low risk disease who's asymptomatic, we quite simply uh, rely on observation. It's hard to make someone who has a long predicted survival and has very few symptoms do better than that um, without causing a lot of harm from say like a transplant. Um, but certainly someone who has low risk disease and symptomatic, we think about mitigating those symptoms with uh, either uh, JAK inhibitors like roxalitinib or interferons or hydroxyurea in certain cases. And if there's a uh, lack of response or disease progression, we often think about then pivoting to more aggressive disease because patients who have been on a therapy, say like ruxolitinib, and then has had progressive disease or worsening symptoms, we know that their survival is, is, more, uh, is worse and their disease is more akin to a more aggressive phenotype. Uh, for patients who have kind of predicted higher risk disease per the prognostic model, we all, these patients are almost universally symptomatic. Uh, most patients will be quite symptomatic with high risk disease. And so they are ultimately gonna need some sort of therapy. When we think about uh, dividing things by platelet counts often, and we focus on uh, low patients with thrombocytopenia or low platelets for uh, either transplantation if they're eligible or a clinical trial or percritinib even, a JAK inhibitor that has shown significant efficacy in patients with thrombocytopenia. In patients with more preserved platelet counts, again, in higher risk patients who are transplant candidates, we think about transplantation. And if you look at towards the bottom of this list, either way, we, we're thinking often about JAK inhibitors as our go-to therapy for mitigating enlarged spleens and symptom and enlarged spleens and significant symptom burdens. And we think about ruxolinib often and fedratinib as well in that frontline setting. Um, patients who are not overly symptomatic but anemic, we kind of trend to focus in on the anemia with uh, 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 drugs that might mitigate that, but really kind of at the centerpiece of all of these algorithms from either the NCCN or uh, European Leukemia Net, or, or when an expert gives, uh, gets up and gives a, a review lecture, uh, JAK inhibitors are always kind of at the center. And this has been a very long story um, from the time that Demeshek in 1951 postulated there was a key uh, path, dysregulation of the pathobiology all the way through the time where ruxolitinib was approved in 2011, and now we also have fedratinib and percritinib that are approved. And soon we'll likely have another drug, we think, um, uh, depending on the FDA's ruling, uh, momolotinib. And although these are all JAK inhibitors, they inhibit different molecules in different ways. Uh, if we look at JAK1 versus JAK3, TYK2, uh, and other off-target effects like ACVR1 or FLT3 uh, can have different effects um, uh, with an individual. So we can start to tailor our JAK inhibitor therapy to given individuals based on the properties of each of these different JAK inhibitors. So what have JAK inhibitors do? Well, the first JAK inhibitor that was approved was ruxolitinib. And ruxolitinib was shown in the comfort studies to reduce spleen size and reduce symptom burdens. But in a pooled analysis, it suggested that patients might be living longer on ruxolitinib versus those who were randomized to control arm. And there was a second claims analysis that was done here and presented and ultimately published in 2022 that I thought was really provocative. And it looked at patients who were, who were diagnosed with myelofibrosis before ruxolitinib approval versus after. And just by virtue of ruxolitinib being approval, survival improved over time, uh, both for those who received ruxolitinib as therapy, but even for those who did not. So even if ruxolitinib isn't benefiting a person directly, you know, there, there seems to be greater awareness and a uh, 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 more deft hand at caring for these patients that's resulted from all this discovery of JAK inhibitors, uh, JAK mutations and JAK inhibitors and understanding the pathobiology and how to care for these patients. Fedratinib was uh, approved uh, on the basis of the Jakarta and Jakarta 2 studies. Jakarta was in the upfront setting where fedratinib at two different doses was randomized against placebo. And this was a contemporary study of the comfort studies that led to the approval of ruxolitinib. Um, and ultimately, it showed significant responses in spleens, uh, spleen volume reduction, as well as symptom burden improvements. So the dosing we typically use now is 400 milligrams daily. You can see here all patients uh, in terms of spleen response was 40, uh, 47%, and symptom response was 36%. So that's at least a 50% reduction in the total symptom burden and a 35% reduction in the total spleen volume. So really, really significant improvement in spleen size and symptoms. But um, fedratinib does have an effect as well on split three. So that does lead to GI side effects, notably uh, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea, as shown in this AE table. 
Um, but like ruxolitinib, we also do see some myelosuppression with patients developing anemia and thrombocytopenia while on treatment. Acritinib is another JAK and HER inhibitor that also has off-target effects on um, IRAC as well as ACVR2. Um, and that uh, has led to this concept of working in a more myelodepletive or cytopenic myelofibrosis population. So the PERSIST-2 study looked at patients with thrombocytopenia, platelets less than 100,000, and patients were randomized between procretinib and best available therapy. And most patients in the best available therapy arm did get low-dose ruxolitinib. Again, in this table, uh, a lot of these patients had pretty low platelet counts and were anemic as well. But despite that, uh, we did see significant spleen volume reductions, um, both in the uh, intention to treat population, again, patients with platelet counts less than 100,000, as well as the severely thrombocytopenic. And this drug was, we were able to deliver this relatively safety, safely in this study, but also uh, due to pacritinib's off-target effect, if you will, on FLT3, we do see the GI side effects as well. Uh, this drug was held by the, uh, from development by the FDA for a period of time due to a concern over increased bleeding and cardiac events. Um, but ultimately, on second review of this data, uh, the hold was lifted on development, and the drug continued on through development and was ultimately approved for patients uh, with myelofibrosis, uh, both in the frontline setting for patients with thrombocytopenia as well as the second line uh, for patients. One of the emerging stories about pacritinib is the fact that uh, some of the patients on the PERSIST-2 study had an improvement in their hemoglobin. And uh, additional analyses going back showed that pacritinib actually also hit, inhibits ACVR1 um, as, uh, and can lead to anemia improvements through modulation of hepcidin, so attacking inflammatory anemia. And uh, so more, there's been increasing interest in, in this therapy as a way to not only treat spleen and symptoms, but also potentially alleviating anemia. So what are the downside of JAK inhibitors? Well, they aren't perfect. This is not CML. This is not a one-hit wonder where we get a drug like imatinib and patients go into a deep remission and do so for a long time. Um, so there always is the opportunity for worsening disease, such as uh, progression to acute uh, to accelerate or blast phase disease, worsening symptoms or increasing spleen size. These drugs are not without side effects and can and exhibit toxicity, and there sometimes is just upfront lack of efficacy. And all these things can lead to discontinuation of the JAK inhibitors. And we see that when patients do come off JAK inhibitors, their survival outside of those who come off due to go to, and go to transplant is quite dismal. Uh, here's an analysis from the group at Moffitt showing that a large number of patients came off of JAK inhibitors due to cytopenias, but some had suboptimal responses or disease progression. Um, but, but when this does occur, when patients go off a, a JAK inhibitor and do not receive any other therapy, or even when they do receive other therapy, their survival is quite shortened. So definitely newer therapies that more deeply affect the disease is desperately needed. Wonderful. Well, here we're going to be hearing from patients and their challenges associated with their medications. They're having trouble to find one that my body can deal with. I do have problems with medications and so they have changed me back and forth several times it's true that this can be a, a great difficulty you know people say well you know having these many medications in a disease that isn't that common is it is it too many and i'd say uh not nearly the case the patients are different. Having multiple options is very beneficial. You know, these medications like will end up having impact on a range of diseases. So we don't have to worry about there being too, too narrow a spectrum of patients, but, but more options is, is beneficial. Hey, Angela, what do your patients say about their medications? So um, from my perspective, also a big component of the reason why we treat patients with myelofibrosis is to improve their symptom burden. So if the medication that we're giving them is causing them some additional side effects, which is negatively impacting their quality of life, in my mind, that seems sort of like against what we're trying to do in the first place. 
So I am very mindful of symptoms or of side effects um, that come from the medications and um, be, make sure that I fully discuss all of the potential um, side effects of a medication and together with the patient um, sort of come up with a, 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 a decision up front whether they're, you know, which medication is right for them the potential side effects, what we would do if they were having side effects, and if they are having side effects, um, identify whether the benefits that they're deriving from the medication are worth the side effects that, they, that, that they're feeling. Um, because it's probably a little, a lot of different than maybe some other cancers where you sort of trudge through chemotherapy to get through for, for a positive benefit at the end. This is a disease where one of our primary um, goals is to improve um, quality of life. And if we're, neg if we're reducing quality of life with our treatments, that just doesn't make any sense. Very helpful. Now let's take a moment to poll our audience. So which of the following was observed in the momentum trial of mamalotinib versus danazol in patients with mild fibrosis? previously treated with a JAK inhibitor. So again, we're asking you this a little bit before we discuss this, just to see how top of mind these results are for you. So if you don't, if you don't know, certainly feel free to click, I'm not sure. Well, it just shows it that, uh, again, we have a chance to share with you these data for momentum. Uh, and the correct answer is a D there. In an open-label period, patients receiving mamelotinib and those switching from denazol to mamelotinib achieved similar hemoglobin. So either those who started or those who crossed over. So let's get into these data. The momentum study was a phase three study of mamelotinib versus denazol in patients with MF. Second line, they were symptomatic and they were anemic. And the honor of presenting these at ASCO uh, earlier this year. Now, mamelotinib, as Aaron had alluded to, is a JAK inhibitor. And in addition to inhibiting JAK1 and JAK2, inhibits ACVR1, which we think decreases hepcidin and increases uh, the hemoglobin, that it helps to decrease some aspect of inflammation and also helps to improve the uh, anemia in the disease. Now, previously there had been studies, the Simplify One study, which I was the PI, had was a upfront randomized trial against ruxolidinib, blinded, showed basically equivalent spleen response, as well as you see really data suggesting a superiority in terms of the need for transfusions, so, so uh, less transfusions needed with, with mamelotinib, uh, and perhaps slight differences in symptoms favoring ruxolidinib, although as we've looked at these data in terms of different analysis, fairly similar really between the two. So the, these phase three simplified studies, you could say in both JAK inhibitor naive, as well as in simplified two post-rux patients, demonstrated benefit in symptoms, spleen, and anemia. Mamelotinib was meant as a complementary study in a very specific set, second line, symptomatic, anemic, randomized against danazol. Danazol really has been one of our cornerstones of therapy for anemia. Uh, is it a perfect drug? No, but I think when we designed the trial, it was reflective of the limited options that we had for MF and then an open label extension phase. The primary endpoint was superiority for symptoms and mamelotinib was clearly superior for symptoms, for splenic response as well, whether we looked at either 25% or a 35% volume reduction. We looked at both recognizing that again, this is second line therapy so that a 25% volume improvement in somebody who's already been on therapy uh, is clinically meaningful. Transfusion independence, the goal was non-inferiority, but really leaned 
to almost achieve statistical superiority. You see the differences there in terms of uh, rates of transfusion independence that really favored mamelodinib versus danazol, uh, as well as you see there in the open label period, the individuals who started off with danazol switched to mamelodinib had improvements in anemia to really match that of mamelodinib. Again, kind of further validating that benefit that was able to be achieved. Danazol, as you see from the left-hand side, certainly had some activity, and I think it helped to further justify its selection as second as uh, the control arm. So my takeaway, as you think about MF management, it's really about optimizing JAK inhibition. Proliferative frontline, ruxolinib is still our anchor uh, with fedranib as a reasonable alternative. Mamalotum and procridinib, probably not frontline in that group. Proliferative second line, again, fedranib, I think that's a natural fit. It's underutilized in that setting, and I think it should be utilized more. Cytopenic MF, again, both bacridinib and mamalodinib will play a role. Uh, I think it will depend a little bit on which patient. Those with thrombocytopenia is the central issue, a more natural for bacridinib and, and prescribable at the moment. Mamalodinib, if approved, probably will favor those patients for uh, anemia. Accelerated blast phase, we don't have a perfect therapy. And again, any of these drugs certainly are considerations in the second or third line setting. Now, many things that are evolving uh, in terms of new therapeutic options, uh, different new mechanisms of action. We've talked about the JAK inhibitors, but other agents being used alone or in combination. Uh, and we'll try to cover just a couple of these. First, we have palabrasib. This is one of the other mechanisms of action that's probably the furthest along. It is a BET inhibitor that has an impact both in differentiation of myeloid cells as well as pro-inflammatory cytokines. And uh, currently was the subject of the MANIFEST study and now the MANIFEST 2 study. Uh, it created great interest with combination in the frontline setting showing significant initial response rates that seem to be higher than historical controls for ruxolidinum. And that is going to be validated in a randomized phase three that is currently accruing. I certainly have put patients on this study uh, myself, and it's a study I think that is of great uh, interest. Second is Navitoclax, a, a BCL-XL inhibitor. Uh, patients with MF have long been felt to have resistance to apoptosis. It's been a natural thought about the addition of, uh, of this agent to ruxolidinib. Again, multiple different studies that have been looked at. This is in JAK inhibitor naive patients, again, showing improvements that seem to be uh, very intriguing and durable. And here again, showing the combination uh, and response rates both in spleen and symptoms for these patients. This too is undergoing a phase three trial in the upfront setting. Anemia is a great difficulty as we have alluded to. Another agent, Lespatercept, is of great interest. It's approved in MDS as well as hemoglobinopathies. And the addition of Lespatercept to those individuals who are transfusion dependent and on a continuous stable dose of JAK inhibition. Uh, here patients are being randomized either lespatercept or placebo to try to show that aggregate benefit. The current time we really have an unprecedented number of phase three clinical trials as single agents, ruxolidum combinations in the front line or as add-on therapies. I think there'll be a lot of interest in these add-on approaches, as well as in the uh, post-JAK inhibitor failing type group. Uh, the greatest number of patients out there at the current time without question are those that are on ruxolinib with a suboptimal response. So I do think that the add-on approaches will be uh, of interest. So in this audio clip, Patients comment on their physician's use of shared decision-making. Let's see what our patients have to say. I had a previous doctor that said I was intelligent, said, pull your chair up next to me. Let's look at this together. And we shared the information. The doctor that I have now does not do that. 
everybody herself and the nurse practitioners that work with her are very, very helpful. And in terms of treatment planning, the only thing we can do is watch my numbers, watch the, you know, the results of the blood tests. So I, I'm glad to see that, that some doctors are involving their patients in planning, but uh, clearly there are still those who do not. You know, I think there are many aspects to monitoring myelofibrosis. Uh, again, mindful of, of busy uh, physicians' practices as, as, again, they are used to discussing I imaging or laboratory results or probably less so around uh, uh, other features. Uh, what do you guys think are best practices? Aaron, you know, how do you think we do this best? Yeah, you know, I, uh, I do appreciate the, the shared decision making as mentioned by the patients here in this little on uh, this slide. Um, and I think that's, inc again, incredibly important. To, uh, you know, we've talked a number of times about, you know, quote unquote, personalized medicine, you know, listening to the patient, seeing what their most pressing issues are and trying to tackle that. And personally, in my practice, uh, I've incorporated the, the symptom assessment form to measure symptoms and, and try to get a numerical sense of how folks are doing, just like I would with labs or MRIs or other imaging. Uh, you know, kind of incorporate that into when to start treatment, uh, when I notice the symptom burden going up or, or, or even assess treatment as going along. So I think, you know, I think that's very helpful. And then you can involve the patient in that say, okay, well, how is your, your, your night sweats? And they're saying, well, it's not bad. It's, it's, it's a six. And I was like, well, you know, looking back now, 10 months ago, when I last saw you, it was only a three. Um, and patients may not realize how their symptoms change over time, but having that kind of record going along in their, in their clinical notes is, I, I found to be very helpful. Anza, any additional thoughts you'd have uh, on top of what Aaron had mentioned? I, I mean, I, I, you, you said it very well, so I really don't have anything, anything, um, you know, more, more to, to add. I, I mean, it's interesting how different, you know, in the, in the video clips or the audio clips, um, the different patients had, had different experiences with different doctors. So I, you know, I, I, I think it, and my low fibrosis patients in general are quite, well, most of them are quite savvy. So do like to be, um, you know, take part in their, in their decision-making process. Very helpful. Let's progress to the next polling question. So which of the following would you recommend for a patient with jack inhibitor naive myelofibrosis who has a plate account of 45,000 but is red cell transfusion independent. There we go. So the correct answer was pacritinib, of which 44% chose, you know, and I think this is correct. I think uh, pacritinib is approved in a line agnostic way. Uh, it certainly can help anemia and even further data, which we didn't present here today, that was at that ASH, you know, really helping to further validate that, as well as certainly for individuals with a plate account of less than 50,000. So to, to bring all these concepts home, if we think about kind of a three to five year outlook, and this is a slide that uh, John Mascaran has put, put together that, that we all, all borrow each other's slides, but I think it was very well done. But as we think about frontline therapy, I do think the, the baseline blood counts are gonna matter. Patients with really low platelets, pacridinib. Patients transfusion dependent, probably that'll be uh, mamalodinib. Those with counts, that are more normal. It may be RUX with or without one of the combinations. And I think the phase three data are gonna be really important to see uh, if we use a combination in which one. Fedratinib remains in the realm for there and it's a very active agent. We certainly will have considerations of jack inhibition with lispatercept. In second line, again, we always circle back. One, are we thinking about transplant for these patients? So that's always implied in each of these. Uh, and again, uh, thrombocytopenia, pacritinib owns that space. Uh, anemia, mamalodinib, if they've not seen it before, certainly should be considered. Uh, if they have adequate counts, fedratinib is really good data, should be considered. Or again, we have the combinations and the which combination will 
depend on the individual and the phase three data will be very important. Uh, I do hope that we evolve to having additional guidance from whether it be molecular markers or others as we analyze those phase, phase three data to best understand which patients to, to treat. So before we go for questions, a, a few parts. Uh, one, it, clearly everything that we've shown for you has really uh, on the basis of teamwork, teamwork not only amongst physicians and investigators, but really amongst the MPN community. Indeed, they've really been incredibly helpful. Patients, I think, have helped to drive the research agenda. I think they have been active partners and participants. Uh, I think they have helped to uh, push us into really being more nuanced in terms of the disease, as well as many direct collaborative projects. So again, enough cannot be said to help these uh, individuals. In this last clip, why don't we hear how the disease really affects people differently? This is a bit of a, a theme of today, both precise and individualized medicine. To me, it's very complex and every patient is different yeah. on how they respond to medication or how they respond to the disease itself. That's one thing that my doctor had stated was, who's to say that you're not going to live with this disease for 30 years? And then it was like, you know what, you're right. I can't sit there and worry about where it's going. I have to live in the moment. And that is very true. You know, it's, it's quite, 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 quite individualized. And as Angela had alluded to earlier, sometimes the anxiety of, of not knowing where the future holds sometimes can really, you know, be a strong negative uh, for individuals that can be impactful in, in a range of ways. We certainly have found mood disorders I, 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 and others. Erin, uh, do you find a wide range of disease behavior in your patients? Yeah, and certainly we, we try to predict these things using uh, molecular markers, prognostic scales, and just our good old-fashioned intuition, um, or the old eyeball test, if you will. But, uh, but it's, it's really hard to predict, and, and there is a range. So, you know, definitely I can think of a handful of patients I have with, they have all the bad mutations, right? Uh, all the aggressive in there, several years into their treatment, and nothing's happened. And you just keep waiting for, is it going to happen? And then I have patients who have just, you know, hardly any mutation, hardly any symptoms, and overnight it seems like things just fall apart. And, you know, those are always those outstanding cases that you kind of scratch your head about and really tells us that there's a lot for a lot more for us to, to learn. You know, folks like, you know, Angela, yourself, who are in the lab working hard to unravel a lot of the mysteries of this disease, it's so important because, um, you know, I think it's, it's hard to predict. And there is a range of responses, there's a range of disease. And that, I think, currently kind of goes back to some of the earlier statements about you know, having a partnership with a patient so they can tell you how they're feeling, how things are going, having those regular touch points as we go along the disease course to really keep a close eye on things. Wonderful. Well, it's been a great discussion, but I'd like to start wrapping things up by summarizing what we've covered and then we'll get to our questions. So, so first, MF, variable clinical features as it progresses over potentially many years. Recent approvals certainly require clinicians to be considering the disease therapy characteristics when you try to individualize a therapy for MF patients. Do they have any, do they have thrombocytopenia? Is there some other factor? Uh, multiple JAK inhibitors in development for MF. You know, I think we'll have this core really a, a four uh, that really will act as our anchor with perhaps in the future, there's some thought of, of other approaches or mutation specific, but I think we're gonna have this, this core four that are really managing folks. Um, amelotinib has significant activity in both frontline and second line uh, patients, and I think will be a, a very in, important option. Now, before we uh, start taking the questions, and we have several that have come in, certainly please put uh, others in. Uh, let's offer some SMART goals. Uh, there are SMART, measurable, achievable, relevant, and timely. So uh, consider new and emerging therapy options for patients with MF, recognize the value of treatment individualization, based uh, on blood counts and other factors, but blood counts certainly seem to be very relevant based on the data and the approvals, and employ new treatment options for patients with refractory disease or disease that is resistant to ruxolitinib or for those that are intolerant to ruxolitinib. So let's go ahead and start taking some questions. We have several that have come in. So uh, let me send out the, the first question 
to uh, Aaron. Are, are there any studies regarding the effectiveness of Jackify? Oh, of course, we always talk about the efficacy of, of, of Ruxolitinib uh, through the comfort studies, but you know, the effectiveness, you know, the real world applications medication, there are some, some uh, kind of claims database work that I showed a brief one there with the survival curves getting better over time. Um, but the, the real world effectiveness is significantly less than what we saw in the clinical trials and comfort studies meeting duration of therapy was three years, you know, response rates were, you know, above 35%, you know, for spleen volume response and, and significant symptom burden response. But in the real world, we'll see median durations of therapy somewhere ranging anywhere from six months in some analyses to 18 months. So clearly the real world effectiveness falls short of the clinical trials. And kind of circling back, I think that's really why we need these, we need all four jacket numbers. We need new agents to kind of broaden our, our armamentarium to help patients feel better and do better and live longer. Um, so so there, there certainly are, are studies that, that try to, to get at that uh, in, a, in a succinct way. Very helpful. Now, uh, Angela, is one prognostic model better than others for, my, for myelofibrosis? Um, I, I, I mean, I, I, you can't really, I guess everybody sort of has their, the one that they go to or the one they're most comfortable with or the one that they, they um, like. I would say that, you know, it seems like at every year at ASH, there are new prognostic models and it's becoming more and more sophisticated. I think the general trend is to incorporate more of our molecular um, markers into into our scoring systems um, to to ha have additional information. So I'm I'm sort of skirting this this question because I, I don't want to say that one is better than the other, um, but it's a it's a continually evolving process and potentially ones that leverage both clinical information as well as um, laboratory information and molecular information may provide a more full picture um, and, and, and give more um, accurate uh, prognostic information. Very helpful. You know, I would just add, I think the key is to know, you know, why you're doing the prognostication to begin with. You know, if it's, if it's regarding transplant, I think being, you know, mindful of the transplant specific ones, I think being mindful of the ET and PV, uh, the post ET and post PV differences from primary model fibrosis, you know, a, a, a is very relevant. Uh, but also to, to, to realize that there are limitations that, that uh, again, you know, prognosis is not the same thing as disease burden right? and to really be mindful of disease burden for, for folks as well. If they're very symptomatic, they may well require uh, therapy. Aaron, let me ask you uh, this question that came in. If mamalotinib is approved, how would we sequence uh, mamalotinib versus procridinib, fibradinib, and rux? Yeah, I think uh, that's certainly something uh, we'll have to deal with in the guidelines uh, when that time comes and something we're actively thinking about. You know, certainly in the upfront setting, um, although patients in, in, in a large number of the trials that have been done with mamalotinib have been JAK inhibitor exposed, you know, there's no reason I think it couldn't be just as effective in the frontline setting. There are frontline data for momolotinib. So, you know, you think about patients who are anemic in either setting, whether they, they were anemic from the very beginning or, or anemic after receiving another JAK inhibitor, it could slot in in both those places. Um, it, but, uh, but clearly, you know, it has that edge on the other JAK inhibitors. I think the jury is out on whether or not it would be better at spleen volume or symptom burden may not be any better than what we already have. So I think it would be hard to argue using it in, in like patients with more preserved red cell counts. Um, I think the interesting point is the efficacy of momolotinib in patients with thrombocytopenia and, and trying to parse out how, how do we think about thrombocytopenia in those patients or, or how, to, how to treat their uh, treat them with a JAK inhibitor. Because um, you know obviously procretinib, as you mentioned, is really established and for patients with thrombocytopenia, and how, do, how does momolotinib fit in with all that? Very helpful. Uh, and, and I would agree. I, I think that is a, a good sequencing. Angela, what are the resistance mechanisms for JAK inhibitors, and are they uh, all, uh, all uh, relevant across the JAK inhibitors? Okay, so that actually, I was really happy when that came in that question came <laughs> in, because that's actually a point that I've uh, gone back in the literature and been really sort of uh, fascinated by lately for some reason. 
Um, so what's really interesting about what we call, I guess, resistance to JAK inhibitors is, is probably a different concept than in other cancers where, you know, you have a, you know, escape mechanisms by which the gene mutates and then is no longer responsive to that particular agent. In uh, JAK inhibitor resistance, um, there's never been identified mutations in JAK2 that are sort of escaped. Um, but what actually happens, um, this is based in, in mostly in in vitro, so in laboratory settings with cell lines and things like that, that actually JAK1 um, steps in and can can sort of transactivate JAK2. So it's 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 a little bit of a, a, a of a different mechanism. Um, in cell lines, interestingly, you treat uh, cells with a JAK inhibitor, they become resistant because JAK1 steps in. You take away the JAK inhibitor, then they become sensitive again. So then that brings up the question, could you just have the person have a holiday and go back on, on the same JAK inhibitor? Um, based on one versus the other, um, I have to say, based on my recent reading um, in the past week or so in, in these studies, um, that actually in vitro with cell lines, um, yes, if they were, if you develop resistance to one, then immediately you would have resistance to another. But then if you remove the drug for 12 hours and you just hit them with the, any old JAK inhibitor, they would be sensitive again. So I don't think that we have the data clinic, or I guess clinically, um, you know, you can sequence JAK inhibitors, but I'm not sure whether if you're asking about sort of mechanistic resistance of the cells growing in the context of JAK inhibitors, we, I don't think we know that, that answer. Very helpful. No, that's a great response. It's clearly very, very complex thing, both in terms of biology and other limiters. Aaron, what treatment do you recommend for a patient with a very low transfusion burden? So I guess that individual that only requires a transfusion every once in a while. Yeah. Yeah, that's tough. I mean, you know, any transfusion is probably not a good thing. Um, you know, we also talk about transfusion dependency being, you know, four units of blood over eight weeks. But, um, you know, I think any transfusion is not good. So a person who's not getting any transfusions at all and has a good platelet count, you know, certainly we think about Ruxolitinib, the, the tried and true JAK inhibitor in those folks. You know, someone who's getting a transfusion here or there, we definitely want to try to address that because in all likelihood, if you were to start Ruxolitinib in them, they may become more anemic and need more transfusions. And, be ideal to try to avoid that if you could. And so that's where um, you can consider uh, alter, uh, other therapies, either a supportive agent to get their anemia better before starting or during starting uh, the initiation of a JAK inhibitor, or, or if it does become approved, a drug like bomolotinib that could potentially improve anemia, even in patients who aren't fully transfusion dependent. Very helpful. Uh, uh, Angela, should transplant be the preferred choice after ruxolitinib? Um, I, if, I'm glad you asked. So I, I'm, yeah, I'm assuming they stopped ruxolitinib because they they were they were not doing well on ruxolitinib in that situation. I guess because we know that people who fail ruxolitinib, you know, they they in general don't do very well. Um, then I think a transplant is is warranted. I guess it depends on what the you know the person's goals are and exactly why did you stop them on rexolitinib? Were you concerned that they if if you're concerned that they're moving towards an AML? Yes, of course they need to be you know they they need to be given a transplant if they're a transplant candidate. Um, you know, but if they stop rexolitinib because they didn't like the weight gain, um, you know, maybe switching to another JAK inhibitor which also may cause weight gain uh, similarly, but, you know, maybe try try a different one. So I think it depends on why the ruxolitinib was stopped and the clinical situation of the patient. You know, I think you hit the, hit the nail really right on the head. You know, in my eyes, as we have more medical therapies, I think progression that clearly is associated with a decrease in survival, like progression to AML uh, drives the transplant question. And if not, I think other medical options, you know, are certainly a, a strong consideration. Well, that's about that's about uh, all the time that we have for tonight. I'd like to go ahead and thank my colleagues, Dr. Angela Fleischman and Dr. Ann Gerth, for joining me today. This has been an important discussion. 
and I do hope that you find it useful for improving patient care. To receive CME or CE credit for today's program, please complete the post-test and the evaluation. You'll be able to download and print your certificate uh, upon, uh, upon completion. Lastly, to rewatch this activity, view other CME Outfitters activities, and find out about upcoming activities, please visit the CMEO Oncology Hub. Uh, again, let me thank Angela and Aaron for a great discussion tonight. Good night, everyone.